Hello, I'm Rockwood artist John Caggiano, and uh, I'd like to welcome you to another in the series of the Meet the Artists uh, program uh, in honor of the Rockwood Art Association's up upcoming centennial uh, at, uh, this next year. Uh, and for those uh, who are uninitiated, I'd like to explain uh, what the Art Association is. Uh, the Rockwood Art Association Museum has been essentially the cultural hub of Rockport since 1921. It hosts uh, 50 plus shows per year. It has 250 approximately artists, professional artist members, and perhaps up to a, a, a thousand uh, um, associates. It also has a museum collection of 650 uh, plus pieces. And it has drawn uh, artists from uh, everywhere, actually, uh, especially here in the United States. Homer, Hopper, um, George Bellows, uh, I believe, had been here. Uh, some of the more uh, ensconced members have been Antonio Serino, Aldro Hibbard, uh, <coughs> um, Emil Gruppe, Anthony Timi, et cetera. Uh, and so, uh, in essence, the, the, uh, we're here to honor the longtime members, and uh, we have with us today, and I'd like to welcome him, uh, Ron Straka. Hi, Ron. Hi, John. <clears throat> um, in, in lieu of what I've just said, uh, I'd like to know where you are as an artist today in the context of what the Art Associ Association is and uh, how you fit into it. Well, <clears throat> the biggest part is I've been teaching there at the uh, Rockport Art Association for probably about uh, 15, 20 years. And, uh, but part of it is I feel the importance of the Rockport Art Association as a learning center, a major center. We've had, uh, in fact, that's where I really got most of my training was going to the demos where we had uh, twice a week top uh, artists, uh, in fact, national academicians coming. Mm -hmm. So here was practical experience. We had a chance to talk with the actual artist and, and, and uh, get a lot from them. I've always felt the importance of education in art. And it doesn't matter what the art form is. But uh, for me, I've been painting ever since I was 10 years old, 12 years old. Uh, and uh, part of that is that the museums uh, have been the major source of my information. Uh, and of course, the Rockport Art Association is a museum in, mm -hmm. in, um, in most uh, um, ways that they can be. Yeah. Uh, I should have added that uh, the uh, Art Association also uh, gives many classes and workshops and uh, is, exactly. you're, you're right, a, a major teaching institution. With a, a wide variety of teachers, so it's not just one style of painting, we have a whole style of uh, different things. My students, in fact, uh, the class that I teach, I try not to teach my style mm -hmm. or any particular style. I look at the students and I see what they're doing, and I try to encourage each individual what they're doing because I've uh, my vast experience in museums. I've spent my whole life in museums, and uh, reading the um, the major artist books, I can tell people, look, here's a situation that you might want to look into. And as uh, Paul Strzok once said, uh, he says, I can't teach you art. He says, but I can. He says, Dumont told him this. He's, Dumont said to him, I just opened a door for you. 
And Frank Dumont had taught at the Art Students League in New York. Absolutely. <clears throat> and Paul Strzok, of course, was a colleague of ours who yes. was in Rockport for 40 years, perhaps. Yes, and Rudy Kaleo also studied with Dumont. And Dumont uh, taught uh, major artists uh, mm -hmm. all over the you know all over the United States. And so, um, how has the association been important in your evolution as an artist, aside from your teaching, then? Well, a, a part of that is, again, uh, the fact that the many shows that you folks have and the diversity of paintings in the shows. So I always go and I look at the paintings. I don't just observe the painting, I analyze the paintings. Mm -hmm. So in looking at these things, it's not that I adopt the style of a particular artist, but I'll see something that they do in the painting and I say, aha, a gem. And so then I can take those gems and incorporate it into my own work. And that's the one big thing I try to, to tell my students is the biggest thing I want, to, want you to do is I want you to be yourself. You can try all the other things to, you know, get yourself started, but keep yourself original. Some of the people who are very um, detailed saying, oh, I have to paint more loosely or whatever, you know, it's the style right now. And I say, no, if, you, if you're a tight person, continue that, but refine it, refine what you're doing. And so what is your major emphasis when you're doing your own work? Uh, I, uh, there's several different approaches. One of them is, uh, I love abstract, but I've been sort of a, a closet abstract painter. What I like doing there is allowing something to come out of my mind to do the abstract. Mm -hmm. uh, Aljo Hibbard's uh, granddaughter did abstract, but she was the kind that had to go to the scene took the original scene and abstract it like you would abstract writing. Mm -hmm. I don't. <clears throat> I just let the free flow come out. Yes. So that's one way. Now the other way is the realism. I like to observe what's there, much like the Chinese style, is you observe, put it in you, and then when you present it, you present your interpretation of it. Now, and are you seeing design, color, what? Uh, design to me is the most important thing. And uh, there's a very good book uh, uh, by Flanagan, I think, uh, on uh, abstract painting. And the thing is that he talks about is design. He says people often talk about composition. Well, composition is only a small part of design mm -hmm. because within design there is color, uh, there is negative space, there is all these things that combine to make a good design. Do you happen to remember the title of the book? We'll just say Flanagan then. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> it, it was on, uh, Understanding Modern <clears throat> Art. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. And, and um, uh, let's do a little bit of uh, background. So you've been here You've been a member of the Art Association for many years, yes, haven't you? Yes, yes. Um, well, I've been coming to the area in 19, well, 1960s. Mm -hmm. uh, I was uh, at a radio observatory over in Hamilton, Massachusetts. So I used to come up to see the museums. I see. And I met uh, Paul Strzok in 1961. And that, that's the time that I got more interested in the Rockport Art Association. So ever since that time, my, all my visits, so if, if I'm not uh, out painting, I'm going into the museum and at the Rockport Art Association and looking and seeing what people are doing. And you had uh, practically lived in a museum. Yes, yes. Uh, my early training was that uh, when I was in, uh, in junior high school, the junior high school teacher says, I want you to go to the museum, the Reading, uh, Pennsylvania Public Museum, with the senior students from, from the high school. So I was kind of an outrider as a, you know, uh, not a senior high school yet. 
But I went there and part of what we did was we drew, drawing. We drew birds, we drew animals, but... <laughs> uh, well, when you were here, uh, you, uh, to, to jump, yes. uh, you lived in Hibbert's yes. gallery. Yes, for 21 years. Tell, let, tell let, us about let that, see. which is almost like a museum in a sense. Well, it was a museum in a sense that the, many of the Hibbert paintings were there. So I would take the uh, Hibbert's out and study them. Now again, it's looking what size, I could figure out what size brush he used for certain mm -hmm. things. And uh, I used to have what I call the Sunday session, where each Sunday I would take a couple hours and I would just study, I'd draw sketches of the paintings and put down the details, some of the things that I learned right. from the Hibbert paintings. Mm -hmm. And the one thing that did happen there, which was exciting, was one time I was painting in the Hibbert studio and all of a sudden I heard this voice coming from out of the sky. And Hibbert said to me, he says, if you're gonna put a stroke in, make sure you can see it from the other side of the room. Uh -huh. Which was, a, I've read all these books, I've talked to a lot of artists, no one has ever said that. So to me, make it what you want, but to me it was a real message. Yeah, that was a great message. Um, who, who did you study with uh, then directly here? Oh, just about everybody. <laughs> uh, who was your major influence? Let's put it that way. We don't need a list of names. Well, the ma major influence, one of them was Paul Rahili, who was, who was quite a, a name in New York and all. Um, and, and was he a member of the Art Association? Yes, he was. Uh, he... Uh, then also a groupie. I used to get together with groupie. You did? Yes, I did. Who was a major name here. Yes, yes. And one of the, you might say, fathers of the association, right. even though he wasn't a founder. Right. And, uh, of course, Paul Strusick. Yes. And uh, uh, recently also with uh, Tom Nicholas. Uh, Tom Nicholas has got me, as I've been tapering down on some of my art, has been getting me interested in watercolor, which I have which I did back in the 60s. Mm -hmm. But I, I just did oil paintings for a long time. And I just recently I started to do uh, watercolors. And m many years ago, you were in another medium, which was? Yes, photography. Photography. In fact, when I was at college, I st stopped doing uh, painting, really. And I did photography at, uh, in, in college. And then I uh, uh, was in the major gallery on Newberry Street, uh, in Carl Simbad Gallery. Uh, and uh, at that time, uh, we had a, uh, a little workshop. Uh, Paul Cabanegro was a big name. And at that time, Marie Cassindis, there was like four or five of us that were taking this workshop. I see. So, and then I studied, uh, I, I did a workshop with Ansel Adams. Uh, that that must have been quite an experience. Yes, yes. How did you manage that? Uh, it was quite, uh, quite an experience because one of the times that uh, Ansel Adams, uh, many of the students were there had these big format cameras and were under their hoods. And, and uh, one of the students that was there was sitting and concentrating and meditating and Ansel Adams come up to him and he says, what are you doing? He says, well, I'm meditating on the subject. And Ansel Adams said to him, you want to do good paintings, you see that trash can over there? Fill the trash can. <laughs> Meaning, take a number of, take a number of photographs. Number of photographs. Yeah. And uh, Ansel was uh, quite a musician. And he used to play in the evenings when we got together, he'd play uh, on the piano, and he actually he had a chance to become a concert pianist, but he, he decided to do photography. He wanted to be outside and, and going in the mountains. Was he a great influence on your photography? Uh, yes, in the sense that he, he taught a, the zone system of photography, which is a very controlled system, and I okay. taught that at the Boston Center for Adult Education. Uh, however, my hero was Edward Weston, 
uh, Edward Weston had more poetry in his work. Ansel Adams, a great technician, and he did have some musicality or poetry in it. But the real person was Edward Weston. And Edward Weston once said, if I don't hear a box sonata in whatever photograph I had, I failed. <laughs> Which showed that. Yeah. So uh, when did you make the, or get the urge to make the jump from photography back to painting? Uh, well, we were showing, we had a show at the De Cordova Museum. In, and, that, uh, and that's in, the, in Lincoln, Massachusetts. Lincoln, Massachusetts. And at the time, uh, Ansel Adams was getting $150 for an 8x10 print. <laughs> Compare that to the prices nowadays. And the rest of us <laughs> were getting like $40 or $50 a print. So I finally decided if I did a painting, I can get more than 50 or uh, 40 or $50 for the same amount of time that I spent. Mm -hmm. So uh, it, was, it was both economic and, and emotional. Yes, emotional too. I mean, so. I still carried that, the creative aspect of it, of, sure. of the, the visualizations of uh, dealing with a subject matter. So going from photographing outdoor things and, and candid photographs of people to painting uh, portraits of people or uh, doing landscapes. So it all fed into it the all, same It all, place. all merged together. In your development. Yes. Uh, speaking of that, why don't we look at one of your paintings? Which one would you like to speak of? Well, first? to start with this one, okay. this, this is one of the older time uh, dragger boats that we used to see in, in the harbor. And that was, the, that was the great days. This was uh, 60s and 70s, uh, where many of the wooden boats were still there. They had character. And um, uh, actually, this, this painting started out as a demo that I did at the Rockport Art Association. Okay. And uh, it sat around for a long time, and I finally decided to finish the painting. So this was, this was uh, finished recently, and I had that in a show locally. But uh, I remember you, the gannet. Yeah, you can you can see the the working people. This is what what was exciting is we would get down there uh, to paint, and the, we could leave our easels, go get lunch, leave everything there, walk away from it, come back. Everything was still there. It's still the be, case, be, isn't be, it? Because the the, the uh, fishermen would would take care of the, yeah. the thing. And um, at that point in time, who was your influence in terms of this style of painting? Well, it was a groupy influence, but uh, one of the people that uh, was a monitor for him was uh, Pat Savali. And Pat used to paint a lot with groupie, and he knew the locations. So when Pat okay. and I went painting, he would take me to the various piers and things like nice. that that groupie used to paint at. Uh, yes. I remember uh, Pat, little little stout fellow, and yes, uh, yes, so. that's great. Um, and so you you your uh, a style evolved over a period of time. I, I believe it's it's probably brighter now. And uh, uh, well, I I think at one point it was more painterly uh -huh. with the groupy uh, the groupy style. Then uh, when I was painting with uh, uh, Paul Strusick, we traveled around. I was uh, in Cornwall, England with him and um, up to Jeffersonville all the time and yeah, Vermont, uh, yeah. painting with uh, in Vermont. Uh, then I started to get to be a little bit more, um, a little bit more flatter in, 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 in the paint. Um, but I, to me, I, I'm an experimentalist. When I did research for the laboratory, I was a physicist. I did as an experimental person. I always wanted to try things and do things. Mm -hmm. and that's what excites me. I like the challenge. Yeah. So the challenge of doing it this way, the challenge of doing it another way, the challenge of doing semi-abstract, the challenge of abstract, all, all plays into what I've been doing. So it's hard for me to say what me is. Okay, well, it's a good segue. Why don't we uh, speak of, the, uh, of this piece? 
the semi-abstract piece yes. perhaps? Well, the big thing is uh, one of my favorite artists is, was Matisse. And Matisse also had, uh, he was a great colorist, which I don't consider myself a great colorist, but I wanted to play the color game. And the major thing that Matisse did was he used the complements. He worked the complements quite a bit. So as you see, where I had green, I got the red, and where I had the, the blue, I got the yellows or the oranges. And, uh, but I wanted to do it loosely, but I also, in terms of design, so I was more concerned, although I had a model, which was painted at the Rockport Art Association, mm -hmm. um, but while I was painting it, I says, I just don't want to do the model, I want to do a background. So the background that I did was, I says, I'm going to make it a designy type of background. I'm going to incorporate more color. So the model itself was, was pretty much the regular colors, but the background was, you know, um, much more design thing. And even the way the various elements of uh, the lines and all the way they're drawn, where they lead to, the one line is leading up and it goes up to the eyes. Mm -hmm. So there is a directionality, things that are in play. And um, it's, it just excited me, it was, it was an exciting time. And would you jump back and forth from yes. realism to yes. semi-abstract work, yes. et cetera? Yes. Um, and, and this... But I go through periods, so, okay. so it's not, you know, it, it may be a short period, but uh, I, I generally am not just one day doing this and then the okay. next day I'm doing that, yeah. So it kept things fresh, I take it. Yes, you. yeah. Um, were there other artists in the area with whom you worked when you did work like this or this was a solitary? Experience well, well it's my uh, most and... stuff, most of this stuff that I experimental with is my 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 thing. Yeah. I'm studying Matisse. I'm studying okay. whatever Cezanne. I'm studying Zorn. I study them very very carefully as to some of the things that they incorporate in their design in their coloring, in their whatever they're doing, in the way they're put it, putting the paint on. Okay. Uh, I, I, I'm always interested in hearing what people's backgrounds are. Uh, and and uh, we know the person in front of us, generally. Mm -hmm. And then you find out that they did all these other mm -hmm. things in their lives. Can you uh, briefly touch upon your life in physics? Yes, I, uh, again, you'll see a diversity in the way I, I did things in physics. Um, I was a solar radio astronomer, and uh, I w traveled all over the world uh, doing solar eclipses and uh, uh, Greece and uh, Peru and... Uh, this was in connection with the military? Yeah, I worked for the uh, Air Force Geophysics Laboratory, which was uh, DOD Air Force, but I was, a, I was a civilian, yep. yes. Okay. Civilian science, a civilian right. uh, research physicist. So I did that and I published 30 some papers and gave presentations at universities and all on, uh, on that solar astronomy. But in addition to that, I was interested in uh, uh, atmosphere, and so I was involved in rocket launches in uh, Alaska into the aurora. So we studied the aurora, and uh, they also did work in the ionosphere. So <laughs> it, it, it's amazing to me. Yeah, uh, uh, an extremely well, obviously educated, but a, a very analytical mind. Mm -hmm. um, and then it would almost be a release yes. to do this work. I mean, well, how, where's the flow? The flow is that when you do research, it's sort of a never ending thing. You publish something, but you're expected to continue on and then update that and you're challenged by other uh, scientists. So you have to, so it's like a never ending process. Mm -hmm. I do a painting, it's done, it's in the frame. So they, they, that gave me something that I could do 
It's like if you use carpentry and you make something carpentry, there it is, it's mm -hmm. done. And so the painting was post physics career? And I, I'm simplifying when I say physics. Or was it went on at the same time? It went on at the same time, okay. yeah. Yeah, at the time I was doing research with the laboratory, I was teaching photography at the Boston Center for Adult okay. Education and teaching uh, outdoor painting at the Boston Center for Adult Education. So you had a lot of ball, balls in the air, juggling. <laughs> yes. Uh, amazing uh, life. Yes. Um, why don't we pause and we'll show you another painting of Ron's. We are back and we have another of Ron's work on the easel. And uh, why don't we take a look? Okay, John. Um, this is part of what the abstract work that I do. Uh, I very rarely ever show it. I often consider myself as a closet abstract painter, uh -huh. but it's just, I love, I love art, all art. Um, this particular painting is in a watercolor. Uh, the way the approach is, I don't think of a subject. I just think of paint. I push paint around, I let it drip down. Uh, sometimes I pick up the painting and tilt it the other way so it drips the other way and I throw a little red in there and well, no, wait a minute, I had blue here, but I'm gonna put red over the top of it. I don't care. I, and I just splash around, I put some splashes in here. But the thing is, I guess there is a certain control that makes it realistic in a way, mm -hmm. even though I'm doing the, an abstract approach. And I don't think of anything realistic until the very end of the painting, until the very end of the painting. All of a sudden I say, gee, that kind of looks like a building. So I scrape out some of the red here, I put some windows and in. What medium are you using here? Watercolor. Okay. Uh, and I love the colors, oh my gosh. I was having more fun with the colors. And look at some of this stuff. This almost reminds me of like an aurora that I used to see uh -huh. in, in Alaska. So uh, uh, sort of piggybacking upon your, your uh, uh, physics career. Yes. Your science career. Yes, yes. So, uh, you know, I had a quote that I read in an article, and um, it's interesting. With science, uh, as in art, you are never really finished. There are infinite possibilities. And it's all, almost the way you are describing this painting. Yes. So. Yes. <clears throat> it's the infinite way of doing these things, but because it is a painting, and I need to have a finished product, as I said, yeah. explained earlier, I then make something out of it. But in addition, there's another thing. Picasso once said, he says, in my paintings, as weird as they are, I have to have something in that an ordinary baker can understand and appreciate. So I read that and I says, oh, he's saying put a hook into the painting that hooks the, the baker, that gives them the baker to look at that and be involved in the painting. Mm -hmm. So what I do is when I do some of these buildings and things of realism, it's the hook. You rec okay. you recognize something, so you'll say, oh, that looks like the building, or that looks like the sun. That's not what I was thinking. I wasn't that's thinking that. So almost that's the passion part of it, uh, yes. in, in a sense. That's great. Uh, and it's a nice transition, your, your realism, semi-realistic or semi-abstract, and then almost totally abstract. Uh, well, I had another wonderful thing variety. that I didn't, wasn't able to bring, John. It's one of my favorite things was a Suma, uh, the Chinese art. I've done that. I had two, two uh, very ink. good Chinese teachers. Sumi Inc., yeah. Who have taught me, one in Boston, one in Washington, D.C. Yeah. And it's, it's my, one of my favorite pieces, but it was so favorite I couldn't find it. Uh, Let's... Um, um, uh, this brings me, it reminds me of, uh, you, you mentioned the story to me. Let's, uh, can you briefly speak about your uncle? Oh, yes. Uh, my earliest start in, in, in oil painting type of thing was when I was uh, about 10 years old. I used to go up into the attic at that time. We used to call them attics. 
and my uncle was painting and I love the smell of the oil paints. The one thing that he did not allow me to do is to say a word. I could watch him, but I couldn't ask questions. I couldn't say anything. But the painting that he did, uh, the, one of the ones that he did, I still have at home now. And I didn't realize until many years later that it was a painting that Teamy, our Rockport artist, had done in, in Dock Square in Rockport. And it tied so everything together. Here was Rockport influence to a Pennsylvania painter of my uncle who was painting this, which influenced me. And years me later, you are about here. Water paint. Yeah. Amazing. And, you know, at 12 years old was my first oil painting. That's wonderful. Thank you, Ron. Thanks for coming today. Thank you, John. Appreciate it. Thank you, everyone. We'll see you next time.